Hey, good morning, everybody. Obviously, I'm not really here in person this morning. Uh, this morning, I have the privilege of speaking live up at our Sault Ste. Marie campus. And I'm really excited about being with them this morning. So this morning, you get to do church the way they do it every single Sunday. Uh, they have the live worship, but then they watch the sermon on the screen. By the way, that's also how they do it on Boyce Blanc Island. That's also how they do it at the Tall Timber Church down in Silver Spring, Florida. So this morning, here's what you get to do. You get to pretend. You get to pretend you're in one of three places. You can pretend you're in Sault Ste. Marie this morning. You can pretend you're out on Boyce Blanc Island this morning, or you can pretend you're down in Silver Springs, Florida this morning, and this morning you get to do church the way they do every single week. Now, if you're a first-time guest with us today, I do hope you'll take time to fill that ticket out that's in front of you, and when the service is over, please take it out to the hub. It's out the doors to my left, your right, and uh, by the cafe, there'll be some folks out there who would love to be able to get that card from you, meet you, and give you a gift bag, our way of saying thank you so much for being our guest today. And I encourage you, stick around for the 1030 service. The 1030 service isn't a preaching service today. It's given all over to our youth who are going to be sharing what God did in their lives on this past week's Florida spring break trip. So stick around for the morning You'll be glad you did. Obviously, next weekend is a huge weekend. We will have our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock here at the Gaylor campus and church online. There will be nursery here at the Gaylor campus, and we do it at 7 o'clock, so you have plenty of time to get home from work, whatever you're doing, and be here. It's going to be a wonderful Good Friday communion service. We'll be passing the elements in their traditional way. I think you're really going to be inspired by it. Then, of course, a week from today, uh, we move into Easter Sunday. It'll be regular service times. I hope you're inviting some folks you know to come and be part. And then, please also mark down two weeks from today, Sunday, April 16th, in both of our contemporary services at the Gaylord campus, Michael Generelli and his wife Heather will be with us. They're the ones that we believe God has led us to to be our next director of worship arts. And they'll be working with our team to lead us in worship that morning. It's going to be a great chance for them to meet our church family. So I hope you will be here Sunday, April the 16th. Well, this morning is part four in our series we've called Betrayed. It's a series in which we're really doing a deep dive into the life of Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed our Lord. Now, in week number one of this series, we kind of introduced Judas to you, and we learned together that there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. In week number two, we focused in on the city of Bethany, where Mary takes expensive perfume and anoints the feet of Jesus, and we see Judas' first recorded words in the Bible when he protests what Mary had done. Last Sunday, we shifted our focus to the upper room, and we examined the Last Supper through the eyes of Judas. Now today, the focus turns again. Today our focus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the very moment when Judas will speak again as he betrays our Lord. Now keep in mind that the Last Supper would have taken place in the Mount Zion portion of the old city of Jerusalem in an upper room. And when they were done, it was dark, it was late at night, Jesus and the disciples would have left the upper room. They would have gone out Stephen's gate. They would have gone down across the Kidron Valley. And they would have begun to go up the western slope of the Mount of Olives into a beautiful garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. A garden they had spent a lot of time in. A garden obviously owned by a rich person who seemed to have given Jesus and his disciples access to it whenever they needed. Now, it would be in this garden, in the early morning hours, that Judas would show up and Jesus would be arrested. 
Now, what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to take the different gospel accounts and merge them together into a chronological order of what happens. And we're only really going to focus in on the parts where Judas is involved. So I want to begin reading in John chapter 18, verse number one. You can remain seated as I do, because I'm going to be stopping along the way and giving some editorial. Here's what it says. When Jesus had spoken these words, the words he spoke in the upper room after Judas had left to betray him, Jesus went forth, and if you mark in your Bible, I would underline that. He went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now notice that it says Jesus went forth. By the way, we'll see that very wording again. Remember, Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew that in that garden, Judas would show up. He knew that in that garden, he would be arrested. He knew he would then be taken through trials and scourging. And, and by noon, he would be hanging on the cross. He knew all that. But it says he went forth to the garden. He could have gone any other direction. He could have skipped town. He could have hidden. But he went forth to the garden knowing what would happen. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me this. Listen, folks. Jesus was not a victim. Jesus is not the victim of a diabolical plot. Yes, there was a plot. But Jesus wasn't the victim. He was a willing participant. Because he came for this very purpose. To seek and to save those who are lost. Now verse 2 says this. Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. Knew the garden. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Now remember, Judas has already received the 30 pieces of silver from the chief priests. He's just looking for the right time to let them know when to arrest Jesus. It needed to be a time when there was no crowd around. Remember what had just happened at the triumphal entry when the crowd said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was not a good time to arrest Jesus. The crowds would have rioted. They needed to find a time when the crowd wasn't there. This was perfect. It was nighttime. It was the wee hours of the morning. Everyone was asleep. And he knew Jesus' pattern. After that meal, they would all go to the Garden of Gethsemane where they would camp out for the evening. It was the perfect place for the betrayal to happen. But notice the end of verse 2 said, Jesus had often met there with his disciples, including Judas. Judas would have spent a lot of time in that garden with Jesus. Anytime Jesus and the disciples were in Jerusalem, that's where they stayed. Can you imagine the incredible conversations over the last three years that had taken place around a campfire in that garden? Now today, that garden is known for one thing. It is the garden of betrayal. But here's what I want you to think about. Before it ever became the garden of betrayal with Judas, it was first a garden of intimacy with Judas. Think about that. I've had the privilege of going to Israel now six times, and each time one of my favorite places to visit is the Garden of Gethsemane. Our guide, his father, uh, used to be the caretaker of the garden, and so we have access to a private section of the garden where the tourists don't go. It looks just like you would imagine it back in Jesus' day. And to spend time praying in that garden is extraordinary. But I remember one particular trip when on the day that we were going to be at the garden and in Jerusalem, there was a couple who was going to be celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. And they said, would there be a place today you could lead us in a renewal of our vows? Well, when I looked at the itinerary, the most beautiful place we were going to be would be the Garden of Gethsemane. And they loved that idea. So there in that private section of the garden, with just our group being there to watch, I led that couple in renewing their vows. 
Now off to the side with our guide were a couple of the locals and they were appalled. They were aghast. How could anyone get married in the garden of betrayal? And I reminded our group that before that garden ever became a garden of betrayal, it was first a garden of intimacy. Not only that, but even that very night, before it became a garden of betrayal, it would become a garden of surrender. Remember what Jesus did in the time period between them arriving at the garden and Judas showing up? He prayed, didn't he? And when he prayed, he prayed this prayer, God, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, please remove it. But not my will, but yours be done. I think it is the great old, greatest model of prayer in all the Bible. God, here's what I would like to see happen. But at the end of the day, it's not my will I want. It's your will I want. Our guide likes to say that the Garden of Gethsemane is the, guide, the garden of thy will, not my will. It is a garden of surrender. I wonder if you need today to kneel symbolically in that garden. Is there an area of your life where you have been so consumed with wanting your will that you've never said to God, even though this is my will, what I really want is your will. So much of our prayers are focused on my will when we should be focusing on thy will. Remember how Jesus taught us to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before this garden ever became a garden of betrayal, it was first a garden of intimacy. It was first a garden of surrender. Now when he's done praying and he's talking with his disciples, Judas and company show up in the garden. Let me read from Matthew chapter 26 as we try to take all these gospel accounts and merge them together in chronological order. Here's what it says. While Jesus was still speaking with the disciples, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by, and notice this, not just a crowd, a large crowd, and what did they have? Swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Judas shows up. With him is a large crowd. Now, how large was the crowd? Well, we're going to see in a moment in another gospel writer's account that it included a cohort of Roman soldiers. Do you know how many soldiers are in a cohort? 600 soldiers. Now, because it was the Feast of Passover, which meant there were millions of visitors in Jerusalem, they often brought in Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra soldiers from Caesarea to help keep the peace and make sure a riot didn't break out. So 600 of these soldiers now come marching into the garden and with them would be the temple police, the Jewish police. The Roman soldiers would have had the swords. The temple police would have had the clubs. We'll learn also a bunch of Pharisees came with them. So folks, there could have been a good 800 plus people coming into the garden for one purpose to arrest jesus now why would they need that many people why would they need 600 soldiers well just in case the crowd showed up just in case word got out and the crowd that hailed him as hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord on palm sunday what if that crowd showed up again they needed to be ready so they come into the garden to arrest Jesus. Now, here was the plan. They needed to know which one is Jesus. Judas has a plan. Verse 48. Now he who was betraying Jesus gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. So Judas says, here's the plan. You'll know which one is Jesus because I'm going to go kiss him. Now, why would he have to identify who Jesus was? Well, remember, this was the days before Snapchat, before Instagram, before Facebook selfies. 
These Roman soldiers didn't know who Jesus was. They'd heard of him. That's about it. So Jesus had to identify him in the dark. Now, verse 49 of Matthew's account goes on and says, And Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, kissed him. Jesus said, Friend, do what you come for. They came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. However, Matthew leaves out something that happens in between verse number 48 and 49. Before Judas ever has the chance to kiss Jesus, something happens. Now, if we go back to John 18, John gives us the details. It's amazing. Look at it. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort, this is John 18, verse 3, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. So again, we see there was a Roman cohort, 600 soldiers plus the officers. They came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now look at this. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming, oh, don't miss that. Knowing that he would be betrayed, knowing that he would be arrested, knowing that he would face six trials, knowing that he would be scourged, knowing that he would carry his cross, knowing that he would be crucified, Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, what did he do? Went forth toward the crowd that was coming to get him. Again, please note, Jesus wasn't a victim. Jesus was a willing participant. They did not force him to die. He willingly laid down his life for you and for me. Jesus went forth to them and he asks them a question. This is before Judas has a chance to kiss him. Jesus is going to preempt it. And here's what he asks. Whom do you seek? Now there's a reason Jesus asked this. He basically is saying this. I know you have an arrest warrant signed by the chief priests. I want to know whose name is on the, 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 the arrest warrant. Who is the one that you have authority tonight to arrest? Whom do you seek? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. His is the only name on the, on the arrest warrant. And Jesus said to him, to them, I am he. He preempts Judas having to identify him. I want you to see this. There's really going to be no need for a kiss. Jesus just says it. I, I am he. Now, by the way, that was powerful wording because it was the same wording that God used when he spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And Moses said, if they ask me who sent me, whom should I tell them? And God said out of that burning bush, you tell them, I am sent you. Jesus was not just identifying himself as Jesus of Nazareth. He was identifying himself as Almighty God. And look what happens when he does. <laughs> and Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. He hasn't kissed him yet. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back all 800 plus of them and fell to the ground. Jesus' words are so powerful that every one of them, including Judas, they all fell to the ground like dominoes. That shouldn't surprise you. The Bible teaches that it was Jesus who created all that is with his words. By the way, that's exactly what will happen at his second coming. He will come back as judge. He will come back with a sword coming out of his mouth. In other words, he will speak the word and his enemies will be destroyed. 800 men fall to the ground helpless. Now you would think that the next thing they would do is simply to get on their knees and worship this guy. But instead they stand back up. And in verse 7 it says, Therefore Jesus again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they probably said this time a little more tentatively, Jesus the Nazarene. Now that they twice have stated who officially is on the arrest warrant, Jesus says, I told you I'm he. So if you seek me, if I'm the name on the, search, on the arrest warrant, 
let these disciples go away. You see, Jesus wanted it to be stated very clearly. Peter's name wasn't on the arrest warrant. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, their names were not on the arrest warrant. Neither was Nathaniel or Thaddeus or Simon or Matthew. What is Jesus doing as he gets ready to go into this horrible passion? He's protecting his own. In fact, it says he said that, verse 9, to fulfill the word which he spoke back in the upper room when he said in his prayer to God, of those whom you have given me, I did not lose one of them. Now, here's what I want you to see. At this point, the disciples are probably starting to leave. They're not going to get arrested. Judas has not yet kissed Jesus. In fact, there's no need to, is there? What was the purpose of the kiss? To identify who Jesus was. Does this group of soldiers know who Jesus is? Absolutely not. After Jesus has said, I'm he, and they saw his power, there's no need for a kiss. But now, Matthew 26, verse 49, immediately Judas went to Jesus, said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. He kisses him anyway. By the way, the wording is very strong. It talks about a fervent, repeated kiss. He walks up to Jesus and just begins kissing him on the face. Folks, this is hatred. This is Judas wanting to stick the dagger in more. He's wasted three years on this guy. Best he got was 30 pieces of silver. And don't forget one other thing. We learned that the Last Supper, Satan entered Judas. He is now being driven by Satan himself. This is not a kiss of respect. This is not a kiss of affection. This is a repeated kiss of hatred. By the way, Jesus calls Judas out before Judas can apply the kiss. Look at Luke 22, verse 47, as we put these passages together. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came. And one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. He was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But before he has the chance to kiss him, Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? What does Jesus do? And he calls out Judas. You know why? Because Jesus knew the heart of Judas. He's making it very clear. Judas, I know your heart. Judas had fooled all other 11 disciples for three years. They had no clue he was a fake. Judas never fooled Jesus. The other disciples didn't see that Judas was in it for what he could get, not what he could give. But Judas never fooled Jesus. The other disciples didn't realize that Judas felt he was better than them, but Judas didn't fool Jesus. The other disciples did not know that he was pretending to be more spiritual than he was, but Judas never fooled Jesus. The other disciples didn't realize that Judas was more devoted to money than he was to Jesus. But Judas never fooled Jesus. And my friend, listen. You may be listening to this right now. And like Judas, you're pretending. You're pretending to be a follower of Jesus. You're trying to convince everybody else you are when you know you're not. You know your faith isn't real. And you may have fooled every single person around you. You may have fooled every single person in this church. But listen, you have not fooled Jesus. Jesus knew Judas's heart. Jesus knows your heart. And after Judas does this kiss of hatred, Jesus responds by calling Judas a friend. 
Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 50. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Jesus knew Judas' heart. But Jesus still loved Judas. My friend, Jesus knows your heart. He knows if you're pretending. He knows if you think you're better than others. He knows if you're just in it for what you can get. He knows if your devotion to money is greater than your devotion to him. Jesus knows your heart, but listen, my friend, Jesus still loves you. At that point, they would have arrested Jesus. There would have been a moment when Peter cut off someone's ear. We're not talking about that because we're focusing on Judas's part. They then would have led Jesus back down across the Kidron Valley, through Stephen's Gate, back up to Mount Zion, to the home of the chief priest named Caiaphas. On my, I think it was second or third trip to Israel. Right before we got there, they had just uncovered the very steps that would have led from the Kidron Valley up to Caiaphas' house. The very steps. Because they had just uncovered them, they did not have ropes around them yet. And on that trip, I was able to do something that was so moving, so sobering, so humbling. I was able to walk up the very steps that they would have led Jesus up bound as they took him to Caiaphas' house. There, Jesus, in the matter of a couple hours, would have endured three very illegal Jewish trials. In between each trial, they would have put him in the dungeon under Caiaphas' house. I think of all the places we visit in Israel, the one that gets me the most is when we stand in that very dungeon where Jesus would have spent time alone in between those Jewish trials and waiting to daybreak so they could take him to Pilate. When we stand in that dungeon, I read a psalm that I believe is quite likely the psalm that Jesus prayed when he was in that dungeon. I'm going to read you that psalm this Friday night at our Good Friday communion service. When daybreak comes... They have now sentenced Jesus to death and they're ready to take him to Pilate because they need the Romans to carry out their dirty work. And this is where the scene shifts back to Judas. Look at Matthew 27. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. I'm going to read all the way through verse number 7. Please follow along. Now when morning came, meaning daybreak, All the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. I'm not sure Pilate realized that was going to be the case. I mean, Judas. I'm not sure Judas realized that was going to be the case. And they bound him and they led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. And now Jesus would endure three more Roman trials before being sentenced to crucifixion. Now look at this. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned to death. I don't think Judas expected that. He felt remorse. Remorse, not repentance. He didn't repent. He felt remorse. And returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. 
And he went away and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it's the price of blood. And they conferred together with the money bought uh, with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. When Judas sees that Jesus has been condemned, he feels remorse. Not repentance. There's a difference. The Bible says there's a sorrow that leads to death and a sorrow that leads to repentance. Let's contrast Judas with Peter. Because that same night, Peter betrayed Jesus in his own way by denying him three times. But Peter didn't just feel remorse, he repented. And oh, did God use him. Judas felt remorse, but he did not repent. He returned the 30 pieces of silver and he went out and hanged himself. Now think about this. Judas hung himself before Jesus ever got to the cross. Judas betrays Jesus and Judas ends up dying before Jesus. Now, I want to hit the pause button here. Because you will often meet people who will say this to you. I don't believe the Bible because it's full of contradictions. Have you ever met someone who said that? And when I meet someone who says that, I like to ask them this question. What are some of the contradictions to which you speak? And nine times out of ten, they cannot give you an answer because they don't know any of them. They've just heard someone say that. But every once in a while, you meet someone a little more scholarly and they will point out some apparent contradictions. And often they will come back to this story. Because there are some apparent contradictions. In Matthew chapter 27, it says that Judas hung himself and that the chief priests bought the field. Now let me read for you what Luke says in Acts chapter 1, verse 17. It says this, For he, Judas, was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. Wait a second. I thought the chief priest bought the field. Luke seems to say Judas did. And then it says, and falling headlong, Judas burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. Wait a second. I thought Matthew said he hung himself. And so some will come back to this and say, contradictions. For example, they'll say, while Matthew records that the religious leaders bought the field, Luke in the book of Acts records it was Judas who bought the field. See, contradiction. You can't trust your Bible. All right. Who bought the field? Well, I think both are right. The religious leaders made the transaction. But whose money did they use? Judas's 30 pieces of silver that could not go back into the treasury. So on one hand, the transaction was made physically by the religious leaders, like Matthew said. On the other hand, it was purchased with Judas' money, just like Luke said. There is no contradiction. Well, what about the way he died? Matthew says he hung himself. Luke, the doctor, says in Acts that he fell into a field and his body burst open and his intestines gushed out. See, contradiction. No, not really. So how did Judas die? Well, if you put the two passages together, it would be this. Judas died by hanging himself. He would have hung himself from a limb, a branch, over a ravine. After he dies and his body is now bloating, hanging there, the limb breaks, or maybe the rope breaks, something breaks, and his body goes crashing down into the rocks in the ravine like a ripe watermelon, it just bursts open. So, what do we learn? That both Matthew and Luke are correct. There are no contradictions. Folks, you've heard me say it a million times. Let me say it a million and one. You can trust your Bible. So we see the death of Judas. 
But what about his eternity? Where is Judas today? Well, biblically, there's only one of two options. He's either spending eternity in heaven or he's spending eternity in hell. Well, by all accounts in Scripture, we learn that Judas was never a true believer. Never. I believe Judas is spending eternity in hell. Now, let me remind you of a few things. In John chapter 13, remember what Jesus said about Judas? He said that Judas was not clean, speaking of spiritually. As he's washing the disciples' feet, remember we saw this last week? He says this is symbolic of spiritual cleansing. He says, you, you the disciples, you're, you're all clean, you're all spiritually clean, you're true believers, except one of you. Because he knew that Judas was going to betray him. Judas was never a true believer. In Matthew 26, when Jesus announces to the disciples, one of you will betray me, he adds this, and woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Why? Because he was going to spend eternity in hell. Folks, listen, once you're born, you never die. Do you realize that? Your soul, though your body dies, lives on forever, either in heaven or hell. And here's what Jesus is saying. It would have been better to have never existed than to exist and spend eternity in hell. And that's how he described Judas. In Acts chapter 1, here's what it says about Judas in verse 24. The disciples are wanting to replace Judas. They say, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you've chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside and went to his own place. Remember what Jesus called heaven? My father's place. Judas did not go to the father's place. He went to his own place. And I believe Judas is in hell today. But remember, Jesus wasn't a victim of Judas's plot. Jesus was a willing participant. Jesus chose Judas to be his disciple knowing that Judas would betray him. And he did so because he loved you. He wanted to die for your sins. I can summarize the story of Judas in four simple statements. Statement number one, there is a real heaven. Jesus died so you could go there. Statement number two, there is a real hell. I believe that's where Judas is today. Statement number three, one day we will all spend eternity in one of those two places. Number four, that's why we all need Jesus. And this Friday, we will take time together as a church family. I think on the most special night of the year, even more special than Christmas Eve, to remember that sacrifice. To celebrate that sacrifice. To proclaim that sacrifice. That night we're going to wrap up our series on Judas by looking at four final truths about Judas as we examine our own lives because there can be a little bit of Judas in all of us. I hope you'll make it a priority to be here this coming Friday night at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, next Sunday, we'll celebrate Easter together. Would you stand with me, please, as I pray and the worship team gets in place? So, Father, there's so much we learn about Judas. 
But the thing that sticks out the most in my mind is this fact. Jesus was not a victim. Jesus chose Judas and Jesus went forth to the garden because Jesus loved me. And I so look forward to celebrating that sacrifice together with these dear folks this Friday. Bless us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.